Welcome back to CCTV's News Bulletin with the following headlines. An interview on data, dissemination and CBI and the 20th anniversary of Chemcom. But we'll start with some questions and answers from the Q&A on the Americas. I wanted to know you, for Mexico you said there was safety data sheet coming from uh, US or Europe accepted. Is it only for imported products or are we talking also about manufactured products? No, also for manufacturing products. I mean, you can use the same uh, design or even the same information. If, uh, if it's in Spanish and it has the 16 sections, uh, I think it's totally acceptable. Um, there's, remember there's this transition period right now to, between the 2018 implementation. Uh, so right now it's pretty safe to use those. Uh, what I'm not really sure if it's uh, starting 2018, if there are gonna be some kind of uh, Definitions, because remember those the differentiations between the, the revision three and revision five between the two norms. So that's the only confusion I, I, I find. But up to what I know, um, do you have a, a, a US or, or Canadian or even EU uh, safety data sheet with the same design or information? It, it's okay to use. So I have to release, uh, expose um, secret ingredients that are lower then 2%. Suppose um, our substance is uh, mainly 95% maximum, and the other 5% is, uh, is separate in little ingredients. Do I have to mention this also? Well, you have to be able to name your substances ambiguously. So there has to be, you have to be able to name them. Uh, but when you have a mixture, when you have several substances that make up your, the makeup of your, of your substance, you need to be able to identify all of them. Now, they could be, you know, variables, and, and you can explain that. But, I mean, if you can identify them, even if they're confidential to your company, you have to supply them to the government of Canada. Now, we keep everything confidential. No, no information will be released. Uh, when you submit a notification to Canada, you need to submit uh, the confidentiality. Share that information with the authorities. Correct. That's it. But you it don't have to mention it on the SDS for Canada. No, you don't no. have to supply on the SDS. So if you submit a notification and you want the, the name to be kept confidential, and you're going to do a what we call a mass name notification, so you uh, you can mask some of the components of your name so that uh, it's not released to the public. Uh, there's a fee uh, associated to that. Yesterday we learned that about 6 million bottles of water drop down the Niagara Falls every minute. A bit more than the water from my shower here in the hotel. I'm curious to see what our local reporter has in store today. Hi Karen. Hey, I see you're in the hotel. Hi Chaird. Yes. I'm trying to find out from your staff where the social event is tonight, but they say they don't know. That is correct. They do not know. As a Chemcon dinosaur that has been around for many years, you should know by now that the location of the social event is a well-kept secret. So you just have to wait and find out. In the meantime, what is your local report today? Today's report is about one of the world's greatest man-made structures. Similar to the Great Wall of China or the Egyptian pyramids, this fascinating piece of engineering should be reviewed. And so here's my report on the Welland Canal. You may already know that the Niagara waterfalls are caused by the significant drop in elevation, about 100 meters or 326 feet, between the waters of the higher Lake Erie and the lower Lake Ontario. It is no surprise then that ships cannot safely manage such a sudden change in elevation. Do you see that shipwrecked barge just on top of the Horseshoe Falls? Back in 1918, this steel and copper bottomed barge was hooked up to a tugboat while helping to dredge out the entrance of the hydraulic side canal of the Niagara Falls Power Company. The tugboat ran aground on an unchartered shoal of rocks and the jerking stop of the tugboat snapped the cable that was connected to the barge. With the force of the water flow, the powerless barge started to drift down the river. Fortunately, it got stuck on Goat Island. With this story in mind, you might be asking yourself, so how do ships that need to sail between Lake Erie and Lake Ontario manage the elevation change if encountering the Niagara Falls is such a bad idea? The Welland Canal is the solution. 
Serving as a ship's opportunity to bypass the Niagara Falls, the Welland Canal was first established in 1824 and underwent a series of expansions and improvements over the next hundred years. The Welland Canal is an engineering masterpiece that allows large cargo ships and small motorboats alike to move stepwise up or down a water-based staircase. There are eight staircase steps or locks that make up the Welland Canal. It takes an average of 11 hours for these ships to travel the 43 kilometers of the Welland Canal, and each of the eight locks can manage ships of about 225 meters in length. Approximately 40 million metric tons of cargo is carried through the Welland Canal annually by over 3,000 ocean and lake vessels. Thank you, very educational. Ships also played a minor role in an interview I had about data, dissemination and confidential business information with Mercedes Vinas from the European Chemical Agency. Here are some highlights of that interview. The topics of today's interview, data sharing and CBI. More and more data is required by many countries and agencies and also within the supply chain there is often need to supply data. However, data can be very valuable and quite frequently data owners like to label data confidential. Pirates in all forms and shapes are especially interested in confidential data. Pirates who might reverse the principle, no data, no market, to confidential data, new markets, new opportunities. A tough but interesting topic I will discuss with Mercedes Vinas from the European Chemical Agency. Mercedes, welcome. Thank you. Can you share with us what is currently disseminated and what ECHA aims to achieve with dissemination? Well, the REITS regulation defines uh, pretty clearly what, what must always be disseminated, uh, but also the information that is to be disseminated unless claimed confidential. I think over time we have um, tried to extend the scope of, of, this, of these provisions on the REITS uh, in ECA uh, to publish some more and more information, uh, such as the information on uh, exposure scenarios. In 2018, or before 2018, a lot of uh, small and medium enterprises will register. Are they already aware of things going to be disseminated? Well, this is a really important part of uh, the work we do uh, with uh, awareness raising. So uh, to make sure that companies not only know that they have to register, but that they also become familiar with the information that will be disclosed, such as that their company names will be appearing on the ECA website. You can watch the complete interview on our website and YouTube channel. Now it's time for the statement of the day. Even if you're able to obtain data, you still have to convert that data into a successful registration. A topic well known to Roger Bettesby, the Managing Director of ABRSA. Roger, welcome. Thank you, Gerd. Good to be here in Toronto. Roger, you're involved in many chemical registrations, uh, for under REIT especially. Can you tell us a little bit more about that? Yes, we have developed a uh, specialty at EBRC for metals and their inorganic substances. And in these cases, we um, speak about um, a lot of um, registrations on uh, streams of substances that are classified as UVCBs. Um, so you have um, um, products of a highly variable um, composition, which, uh, however, also are of commercial value because of minor constituents uh, which are contained therein. Uh, which have value for recycling. On the other hand, um, the, exactly these constituents may, defy, uh, may require by default an enormous um, stringent classification uh, for hazards, which implies that uh, handling, transport and storage becomes difficult. And your statement is? REACH does not work for all substances. Okay, interesting. Please let us know what you think about it. Roger, thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Before we finalize with the forecast, let's see if our local reporter is already on her way to the social event. Hi Karen, and Karen. Hi Cheered, I'm here with Karen Armstrong. We're just taking a trip down memory lane, thinking back about all these different ChemCon activities. Nice, a great opportunity to ask Karen as founding mother of ChemCon what inspired her in 1996 to create ChemCon. In the meantime, I'll come down and enjoy you. Karen, maybe you can tell us a little bit about the early days of ChemCon? I remember the first one in Mannheim. Um, it was much smaller, of course, because it was the first one, and it was by invitation only. Mm -hmm. So that was a challenge, um, because a lot of people tried to get more than one person in per company. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> um, much less high-tech, too. We used uh, transparencies, and uh, getting those copied and not sticking to each other was a challenge. Right. 
the other people that were really high tech used 35 millimeter slides in the old carousel mm -hmm. dispensers. And um, so we thought we were really something. Of course, now everything is electronic and very fancy. Um, but what's been consistent, I think, through the years is the quality of the conference, not only the speakers and so forth, but the quality of the conference itself. And do you think it's still relevant today? I mean, it's obviously been a number of years. Are we still relevant? Very much so, I think. Mm -hmm. I think the, the hallmark of ChemCon is, though, it's grown with the times. Mm -hmm. Because in the beginning, we spoke about the regulations and what do I need to do for Form C for China, et cetera. Right. Um, we moved further on into interpretation of the regulations and developing some cross-cutting issues. And now we're into much more looking at our customers, at the um, stakeholders, and who needs to know this information downstream. and so. Um, I think we're moving appropriately with the times. Any great stories, anecdotes, favorite memories? I think my favorite one was New Orleans. As only Cheered could do, he managed to block Canal Street and all of the conference, 300 people or so, gathered in front of the hotel right. with a, mm -hmm. a brass band in front yep. of us. Yep. yep. And we all had our alcoholic drinks in our hand yes. and yes. marched down the street. People yep. threw beads at us. They thought we were important. And yeah. Right. Our whole 300 people marched across yeah, yeah, Canal just Street us. just for us right. to, um, to the social event. So that was pretty fun. Oh, there's Cheered. Hi. Wow, what a beautiful backdrop. All CamCon events since 1996 mm -hmm. together with Karen Armstrong. Mm -hmm. Not only the creator of CamCon, as you know, mm -hmm. but also the only one that attended all 23 CamCon events around the globe. Mm -hmm. So it's not only our 20th anniversary, it's mainly Karen's 20th anniversary. Right. And therefore, as a token of appreciation from Karen, myself, and the whole CamCon family, we like to give you a small present. Thank thanking you. you for your time and talent that you spent for CamCon achieving its 20 years of success. Well, thank, thank you, you so very much. much. Well, thank you. Beautiful. Remember them all, okay. Where's New Orleans? Yep. Great stories. It's Wonderful. time for the forecast. I have to run ah. upstairs. Okay. So see you later at the social event tonight. Okay. Finally, it's time for the forecast of the day. In the morning, we focus on European issues like ECA's regulatory strategy, REITs authorization, poison centers, and supply chain communication, followed by a roundtable discussion on data and CBI. After that, we go from down under Australia and New Zealand up to India and Russia. Thank you for watching and enjoy this evening's social event.